what can go right is that people stop looking at life as a game that you win. If the object of the game is to keep the game going for as long as possible, to sustain fun and joy for as many people as possible, then it's a very different kind of play that we're looking at. Hi, Vicki Robin here, host of What Could Possibly Go Right, a project of the Post Carbon Institute. We interview cultural scouts, people who see far and serve the common good, and social artists, people who feel deeply and act with courage in the face of uncertainty. As we work to protect what we love, change what we can, and learn as we go, our awakened hearts are absolutely necessary partners to our critical thinking minds. Today's guest is Douglas Rushkoff, and he needs no introduction for fans of what could possibly go right. This is his third romp through topics of mutual fascination. We're both trained in improv comedy, and I think you'll see evidence of that. Douglas is the host of Team Human podcast and author of Team Human, as well as a dozen other best-selling books on media, technology, and culture, including uh, Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, How Growth Became the Enemy of Prosperity, Present Shock, uh, Program or Be Programmed, Media Virus, and the novel Ecstasy Club. His latest book, Survival of the Richest, is slated for September 22. He is professor of media theory and digital economics at CUNY Queens. He wrote the graphic novel, Alistair and Adolf, Testament and ADD, and made the television documentaries, Generation Like, Merchants of Cool, The Persuaders, and Digital Nation. He lives in New York and lectures about media, society, and economics around the world. And so here's Douglas, enjoy. Okay, Douglas, my dear companion on this strange, strange journey. It is so great to welcome you back to What Could Possibly Go Right. I know you have a new book coming out, Survival of the Richest, in which you trace the origins of what you call the mindset, the drive of the ultra rich to dominate through technology. So team human be damned. To explore several theories of why we're heading into a box canyon of class war and pathological politics, I'm going to get biblical for a second, citing the four horsemen of the apocalypse. It says, when the first four of the seven seals have been broken, four riders shall be summoned, conquest, war, famine, and death. With them, these riders shall bring the apocalypse. You know, so conquest, war, famine, death, check, 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 check. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and Thomas Berry posited that the Black Death in Europe, uh, in other words, death, ignited a never again drive to dominate nature. And some people go back to agriculture, the domination of the land. And for our current consumer madness, I go back at least to the bankers who invented debt with interest to finance the exploitation of the new world. And that meme of growth and the rich getting richer has gripped us ever since. And you cite the ultra rich world domination tech team of sociopaths. But you know, I'm not, I I set this up but I'm not as interested in this why as I'm interested um, in your and my belief in team human. The people who are mostly good and mostly helpful and together can make wonderful communities. So in the blurb for your new book, it says, this mind-blowing work of social analysis shows us how to transcend the landscape the mindset has created, a world alive with algorithms and intelligences actively rewarding our most selfish tendencies, and rediscover community, mutual aid, and human interdependency. So, I'm on, I'm on that team. I'm on the team human. As you know, this podcast asks what could possibly go right, not as optimism, but as a combination of clear seeing and heartful action in a world seemingly gone mad. So with all of this setup, my friend, from the four horsemen of the apocalypse to the Black Death, et cetera, 
over to you and go where you will, and we will discuss. Mm. What's interesting in some ways, Team Human, the last book I wrote, is the answer to Survival of the Richest, which is the more recent book I wrote. But, you know, the Team Human, which is arguing that being human is a team sport, and we've got to do this together. Um, it's almost as if the urgency of that set of solutions doesn't make sense to people unless I actually expose the false premise of winning at capitalism. I feel like people are still holding on to some vestige of hope that they'll be on the side that somehow makes it through the bottleneck at the end of time, you know, and will be one of the survivors of whatever it is. And that was why it was fun to take the sort of the billionaires and say, okay, Let's look at how the wealthiest and most powerful people in the world think they're going to make it through and to look at they're building these bunkers, they're building rocket ships, they're trying to figure out how to program human Navy SEALs to protect them after money is worthless. They think that their water supply is going to be somehow distinct from the water table in which they're their bunkers exist. They think they're going to somehow filter the air. They have plans. One of these guys had plans for a swimming pool, a heated swimming pool in his little dome. And I'm like, where are the replacement parts for your filter and heater? Where are you going to order those? Right. When, when and it's like, they're not, they're not thinking rationally about it. They're just playing some weird, you know, uh, uh, walking dead uh, scenario. So for me, where things can go right is that we can come to see how, I mean, I mean, we regular good normal people that you're talking about can come to see how we've internalized some of the values of these crazy billionaires, these people who are addicted to scientism and capitalism and all the others and domination and all the things that they think can work and um, and see where it came from. And you go, oh, OK, so the idea of scientific domination of the world um, uh, uh, that came from Francis Bacon and these folks that thought that they could somehow beat the plague and get away from that. Or this other idea of dominate. Well, that came from people who were afraid of women and had all these other. And once you look at it and go, oh, I get it. These tech bros, they want a, a, a Japanese style robot sex slave because they're scared of a relationship because they don't know what a relationship is because they don't know how to give themselves. And oh, my gosh. I don't want to be like Musk and Zuckerberg and Gates, and I want to be just me. Um, and then that's what, what can go right is that people stop looking at life as a game that you win or that you win by somehow uh, uh, vanquishing or like your, your, your horseman conquest through conquest conquest. If you conquest is losing as far as I'm concerned, if I'm it, winning if there even were such a thing, it, 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 how do you win at an infinite game, right? If the object of the game is to keep the game going for as long as possible, to sustain fun and joy for as many people as possible, then it's a very different kind of play that we're looking at. So uh, the good news is that either because it's unattainable or because we will expose it as utterly vapid and devoid of true joy, people will begin to aspire to something they already have rather than something they need to get. And once that happens, capitalism goes away. Consumption for consumption's sake goes away. Winning and separation and domination are unnecessary because we all already have it right now with each other. Wow. I love that you quoted one of my favorite books in the world. Of course, we would have favorite books, which is James Parr's A Finite and Infinite Games. And, you know, the finite game is playing to win and the infinite game is playing to play. 
And, you know, my life has been about creating infinite games that go finite. I don't know, somehow or another, the finite mind, you I know, know can't help it. How do I win? How do I win at this podcast? How do I win? How do I win? What's, what's the object of it? Oh, maybe I could sell a book. How Can I sell six books through this podcast? Then I've won. Wait, dude, I won. No, no, no. I'm going to sell my book, dude. Right, all right. You sell your book. Or can I win the art? Can we have an argument that I can win? Yes. Okay, and then we fine. Leave, I'm right. And you're I wrong. Win. How about that? <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like crazy. So all I'm a we can woman do, and I have to be right. All right. You can be. You can be. Okay. If you want, if it's fun, if it's fun, <laughs> be right. Um, but but what we can do instead, the reason to do these podcasts or anything that we do in public is to model non-winning behaviors, you know, <laughs> is to model, exactly. model uh, unconquest, whatever that looks like. That's right. Surrender, I, you, know, I guess. you set up the ball and I, you know, I, I throw it back to you and and then I set up the ball and you you hit it and we set up the ball for each other and we mm -hmm. have fun hitting it. And <laughs> it is kind of fun. It's just like, yeah, it's called it's called, you know, like playing toss, you know, <laughs> having a ball and tossing it back and forth and considering it a good evening, you know, no, a good summer evening. Yeah. So it's, you know, how do we this is really a communications issue. You know, this is like, how do you break the trance of you are, you know, you're going for a cotton candy prize that you are not going to enjoy once you get it. How do you break that? And I, I will say, talking about one of my books, um, you know, the, the thing that was that was most revolutionary in there, well, actually that created the greatest change was that we, we translated money into hours of life. We told people, you know, you spent $50 on the shoes and there you calculate your real hourly wage after taxes and car fare and daycare and da, 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 da. And you realize, you know, most people that they're making a quarter of what they actually think they're making. You know, so whatever, you're $40 an hour, it's like $10 an hour. So those $50 shoes are five hours of your life. Ugh. And once that penny drops, that there is a life energy cost to consumption, it starts to break. And then it gets worse because, you know, if you pay the minimum balance in your credit card, you're, you know, like the amount you're paying for those shoes once they're paid off is probably about $200. And so you just start to like reveal the, you have to reveal the cost in terms of something that you prefer. You know, it right. can't be nattering and moralizing. It's like, what are you losing by going for this? Or this is the positive way. I mean, I remember when I was 14 years old, I got my first job. It was uh, uh, a I was the tennis court attendant in Scarsdale. Right. <laughs> so I would sit, you know, and and these these women in little skirts would flirt with me and white, you know, the housewives in white skirts with tennis rackets. And I would tell them if they, you know, sign them up for the court. But I knew that if I did it for three hours, that I would have enough money to go to Alexander's and get a record. That was enough. Three hours got me a record. And to me, that was a good deal. Right. I would do it from eight to 11 in the morning. I'm done. Mom, let's go <laughs> to go to Alexander. But it that that mentality about money stayed with me throughout. So, yeah, I do. You know, and it's not that I'm miserly in some awful way, but I do look at everything. And how much work does it take? Not just but it expands. So here's this iPhone, right? That costs three hundred and ninety nine dollars or something when, when I got it. And it's like, what does it take me to get that? How many you know days of work or whatever that I do to get that? But then I start looking at the rest of the iPhone. How many laborers did it take? How much carbon footprint did it take? What are all of the so there's the the consumptive cost, but then there's the externalities of the thing. And when you start looking at that, you just want to not, and, and, and it can be depressing, but you want to not get anything. So it's like, oh, right. I'm going to replace my, you know, my Ford, you know, Taurus with a, a Elon Musk 
Tesla so that I have a low carbon footprint. But you know how much carbon you have to use to trade in your Taurus to go buy a brand new friggin' Tesla where the kids get sent to the slave camps to get the molybdenum and the, and what do you do with the battery and the lithium after the thing is done? And you look, and you just don't get a new car. And they go, oh my God, I can't drive. I can't this, I can't that. But then it becomes liberating all of a sudden. It's like, well, wait a minute. You mean I can't drive all the way over there for my job? Oh my, I'm not going to be able to work in the factory anymore. <laughs> oh no. So I'm going to have to instead, you know, work over here at, you know, making candles with Mrs. Smith or making cider over here or teaching kids math in my own house. And all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, my life's getting better, not worse as I deprive mm. myself of the, the supposed uh, uh, comforts of, of end stage capitalism. I wonder if the if the very sort of technologies that you're talking about that are, you know, fuel the, the mindset, you know, the worldview. Yeah. That um, that we're somewhere a little too far along with bonding with our technology and our products. You know, I'm not going to be a doom doomer. I possibly could be, but I'm not going to do it now. Um <laughs> But, but it's, it's, um, you know, I, I, I used to say that the consumer culture, the, the way it works is it breaks the bonds between humans. And because every broken bond is a site where a product can be inserted. Like, you know, a divorce is great for the consumer culture because it's two refrigerators and two stoves and two apartments, you know, so basically there's a, and that this may be another, um, rationale um, for why you might want to surrender some of your love of the consumer culture. But, you know, let me give an example from where I am, because um, <laughs> my community, I live on an island in the Pacific Northwest, you know, it's got plenty of like political diversity um, and cultural diversity. But where I live is sort of an accidental gated community for old people, you know, and, and in part it's, the, no, I don't like, I don't want to be. Yo, yeah. Want, you think I those want. gates were put there by accident? No, no, <laughs> no it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's an economic gate. It's yes. like houses that, that just eight years ago went for $250,000 are being bought sight unseen cash on the barrel head for $800,000. Oh my God. You know, it's like, it's like, it's being bought up. So, so, you know, and the conversation about affordable housing ever since I moved here umpteen years ago has been like, we're going to form a commission. We're going to have a conversation. We're going to do a presentation. We're going to, <laughs> you know, nothing happens. I mean, there's promise of things happening. There's pointing to things that could happen. There's efforts in that direction, but we're not getting there. And as every delay price goes up, because it's the free market and, and real estate is financialized. It's a place where people want to put their money, you know, in land, you know, like, oh, they're not making more land. I'm going to go buy some of that shit, you know? So there's a little subset of us who are trying to promote a solution that I've done, which is on the ground floor of my house. I have, I have put in two little studio apartments. And so over the course of owning this house, I have probably housed... 25 people. Uh, and for, you know, really low rent. It's not like a low rent district. It's a really nice house. So we're trying to promote that. But, you know, people, single people are living in 200, 300 square feet. And they're afraid of other people. They have tons of empty space. But it's very challenging to think about, you know, because about you know creating a little apartment and having some ne'er do well or low life or you know in their house. So it, you know it seems like the social fear is a big impediment. The the habit of becoming afraid of people and really not of your class. You know we used to call them essential workers two years ago and we like mm. clapped on our balconies for them. And now that we won't have them in our houses and we won't do a little studio apartment. So it's like, I, I just feel the crunch of this social antipathy 
And what you're saying is that we have with installed within us, we have a social cohesion gene, (laughs) but it's gotten sort of um, suppressed or occupied. Yeah, it's interesting. By I mean, the separation team. There's, there's two, there's two lines of thought there. One is the classist thing, which is real. You know, it used to be people lived in the city, and then they didn't want their slaves so close to them to see them and smell them and worry. So they had, they put the slaves out in the suburbs. Then, when the railroad lines came out and real estate investors wanted to make money on the parcels of land in the suburbs, they put the slaves and the and the, the the enslaved people and the servants back in the city and the wealthy people came out to the suburbs to have those little estates and then it's kind of reversed again now if you have to be rich to get into the city and the the people of color are coming out of the city so it goes back and forth that there is that class thing where and the wealthy people are afraid to see you know, even in the neighborhood I'm in, I mean, we're half of us are extreme progressive lefty Bernie people and are trying to do low income housing. And the other half are like, wait a minute, you're going to let low income housing people here. You know, oh, no, what's going to happen to our kids and the birth control? And, you know, what I mean, people just go crazy. Right. It's like it's like reefer madness or something. They're they're that afraid. So there's that. But I think on even a more fundamental level, there's such a transactional bias in the way human beings relate to each other now. It feels clean and fine. If I pay you and you do the thing and then you go home, then you do me a favor. Then I owe you something. And then what? Yeah, like, I don't want the old lady next door who's had nine children to come over and teach me how to latch my baby to my breast. I'm going to hire a professional lactation consultant to come do that and do it on the insurance. Because if I let that lady come over and and she teaches me how to do this, then then well, when I have my Hanukkah party, do, do, do I have to invite her over too? Now is she in my world? How do I? Ugh, what if she has trouble? What if she falls down and I can't get up? Do now we have to be the ones to get her the ambulance? It's like, yes, you do. You know, <laughs> you know exactly. And people, people have lost it, and partly it was the shaming of sex and the weirdness of genders and all these things, but. Partly that's the triumph of capitalism, of living in a free market society is, you know, I, my agency and my autonomy and my, what the tech bros like to call sovereignty, my sovereignty is something I buy with my money. And people have so bought that idea that money buys you everything that they can't quite wrap their head around the, the, the less numeric uh, uh, less easily calculable social complexity of living with other people in the real world. What did you do for me? What are, you no, know, it just happens. This is what Marx was writing about that no one understands. Socialism is not this state run central bureaucracy thing. Socialism meant that before money, before commodity fetishism and market values, All of our exchange was social. Joe went out and killed a pig while Mary was home and tried to make tortillas and the kids lit a fire. And when everyone came back, we got tortillas. We got burritos, you know, and it's a social phenomenon. And we're each depending on one another to do our part so we can eat together. And that's it. And it's it's. You know, once we're separate, once we're alienated from each other and have to use coin of the realm in order to make those interactions, what happens? The people who make those coins make a lot of money. They don't want us just exchanging stuff. The people, money is a business. Money is not a utility. Money is a business. Every time you buy and sell something, you are buying the bank's product. You know, and just right. because you go to friggin' Bitcoin doesn't change that. You're just buying a different bank's product, a, these nerd banks product instead of when you're allowed to just do shit for each other for, for no reason other than, oh, here's some food. You want to teach my kid math? Cool. It's all just part of living together. So how do we break the spell, my friend? Because it's not just 
enough to demonstrate that we're having more fun, which we are. I mean, look at us. We're making social capital right here in front of everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's like the, as we used to say, the $64,000 question, which of course now is the $64 million question. But, you know, where do you see the spell being broken rather than how can we do it? Where right. do you I like see? That. Because, you know, I'm always against the how do we get people to blank kinds of questions? Because then it's like, oh, you know do this. So let's go get them to do this. That's like, you know, all those kind of British guys talking about about how do we help people make sense of this new world and do pattern recognition in the postmodern <laughs> psychedelic neo gothic whatever. You know, it's like, oh, please, you know, you're not even <laughs> making sense to yourself. You're going to teach me how to make Exactly. Um, it's so arrogant. I just want to say that is so arrogant. And I was I in the business of doing that for many years, being right, you know, sweetly. <laughs> right. It's more a matter of where do we see these things being modeled so that we can help celebrate and amplify and 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 uh, platform some of these great people doing great things, you know, uh, frightfully little in America. You know, um, sadly, you know, you see it in the the seed sharing co-ops in India. You see it in a lot of the you know African villages who are learning uh, mutual aid. But there are places where you see uh, mutuality. You see uh, 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 community gardens, um, uh, uh, a lot of little tutoring networks. You saw it at the beginning of COVID when people would. Someone would, you know, put up a Google Doc and you'd list the hospital on the left. And then what do they need in the next column? And where do you drop it off? And who's got it? Um, you, 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 I very often see it at the beginning of a, the first three weeks of a crisis. Totally. <laughs> exactly. I had a friend who was, uh, I don't know, a social scientist or something. And he was hired by the Red Cross to go into, to research what, how the Red Cross could do a better job of going into disaster areas. And so he went in. And what he what he found out was in the first two weeks, the Red Cross is irrelevant because everybody's helping everybody and they remember it. It's sort of like war stories. You know, remember, remember back then, you know, when we had the tornado. So I want to posit something radical. And I, you know, I get in trouble with my progressive friends about this. I think that. People on the right, not extremists, but people on the right may be having more fun. They get together for barbecues. You know, they get together for dances. You know, oh, my God, they're not wearing masks. Anyway, you know, they're, they're wrong. But, you know, masks, celebrations, barbecues, um, church events, you know, just I can't tell you the number of, of things I've seen in my community where the people who go to church and help each other through their churches, especially I had a neighbor who's LDS and, and they were just astonishing. She organized some of the young men who were on their mission work to come and like fix, you know, like rake my backyard after a windstorm. Uh. It was like unheard of. I took a picture of it. I posted it on Facebook. It was like, where can I go get some of those mission guys, you know? And, and, um, so I think, and, and especially, especially in the black church, you know, and in mosques and yeah. in, you know, Latino uh, churches, yeah. people banding together for the common good happens way more center left, uh, right of center than it does left of center. Yeah. I mean, I it's partly posit. because, you know, uh, left of center or we're, we keep trying to depend on some government universal system to do this. And we forget, you know, the whole I mean, the whole point of universalism, if the Jews invented it, the whole point of universalism <laughs> was to get God and authority out of the way so that you turn back to the other people. You stop worshiping the idol and then it's a peer to peer society. God you know, God said, you know, take the idol off the statue, off the off the ark, have an empty friggin tent, face each other. And there between you, I'll 
I'll come. I'll that's where I'll be right. between you. Right. Um, and that's and that's what universalism should have done. I mean, the Enlightenment got kind of hijacked by central authority in, in a weird way. It, 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 it's it, it's it's odd how that happened. But no, I agree with you. And it's not just a right. It's really a great way to recognize um, uh, uh, social health is if there's more than one or two generations there at the same time. You know, I mm. always talk about my my trip to Rome when I was in college and I'm walking around Rome at night and I see, you know, sitting on the stoop, there'll be old ladies with with, you know, knitting or whatever, with babies at their feet and teenagers making out right across the street and a group of men over here throwing dice and uh, housewives talking. to, And it's like. What you mean? All like I'm looking at four generations of people enjoying each right. other, watching out for each other. In, you know, everyone was 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 enjoying themselves and in one way or another responsible to everyone else who was there. And it was just mind blowing. And I remembered I remember talking to my mom after that, telling her. Remember when we were poor enough mm. to have community before we moved to Scarsdale and we lived in Queens and there was one barbecue at the end of the block and everyone brought their stuff there on a Friday night. You could get Selma and Al, the neighbors would cook. We would trust them to for me to go down the street with my patty or my hot dog and they would cook it for me to eat. Because it's on the they're there manning the grill or womaning the grill. And we moved to Larchmont and to Scarsdale. There was no barbecuing with the Joneses. It was barbecuing against the Joneses. You know, <laughs> who has the bigger barbecue? Right. And the better we got porterhouse. Oh, we got sirloin and they got filet. It's like, oh, my God. What happened? What right. happened? Now you know, we have portobello mushrooms. Right, exactly. And impossible, <laughs> impossible burgers. But I got stuck in that possible burger thing. Don't you? There you go. Oh, my God. You, you know, know, so, so we, here's, yeah. here's something I'm thinking as I listen to you. That um, being right will not save the world, no matter how right you are. But stories will. So I would like to make a pact with you that every time we see social capital being built, we celebrate it even if it is outside the narrative of right and wrong that we might subscribe to. Now it's like tough because, you know, the Huns get together and they, you know, they have their barbecues and you might not want right. to support the Huns and barbarians. You know, it's like with the truckers in the trucker protest, you know, I celebrated Occupy Wall Street and I celebrated the truckers because they were having a good time together. <laughs> I celebrated XR and I have friends who hated XR because they just right. jammed up London. But when the truckers do it because they're the truckers, we, we refuse to recognize that there's something going on that's part of democracy and part of social capital. Right. So well, you're not really... going to the Nuremberg rallies or anything. I mean, you're not. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not social capital. That's authoritarianism. Right. Yeah. So it, we, it has to be social capital, it has to be people with people, you know, maybe. Right. So if Nuremberg was a kind of BYOB thing, then maybe. <laughs> and you could go with your patty. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing is, can you show up at your neighbor's door with your patty and they'll cook it for you? <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's sort test. of gone. <laughs> yeah. In the liberal cities. Um. It is. I mean, but, I don't and, need to be it, dismissive it about and disease just certainly doesn't help that either now. You know, all the COVIDs and monkey poxes and everything else out there really helps people justify all that alienation and professionalization. You know, you'd the almost think it was a conspiracy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in this in the new book, I call it the dumbwaiter effect. You know, and most people think that the dumbwaiter was created, you know, that Thomas Jefferson wanted to save his slaves or his enslaved people the trip up the stairs. And no, the dumbwaiter was so he didn't have to look at the person. It just the food just arrived magically as if from a box and the labor is hidden. That's like Grubhub and Amazon and everything else. It just arrives in a box. A ding. You know, you get a, a text message that your thing has arrived and no human 
You know, I it's know. like the, the Chinese laborers that use a special toxic chemical to wipe the fingerprints off the phone after they've assembled it. So we can hide the fact that there were human hands that is, that put the thing together and that chemical shortens their lives. So great. So they're shortening their lives in order to hide the fact that there was a human being involved in making this thing. I don't know. You do though. I no, I really so I live, I moved to this island, but you will, you will someday cross the great continent on your donkey or something, with your little donkey cart, and you will come and see me. But it's like I lived, I moved to this village of a thousand people. That was about 20 years mm. ago I moved here um, on an island, you know, that's serviced only by, you know, a ferry in the, nor- in the south and a bridge in the north long and skinny, et cetera. And I was like, I would just marvel when I first moved here. I said like, this is, this is like high school where people, you know, the jocks and the brains and the, you know, cheerleaders and, you know, all these, and the nerds and the, you know, all the different types of people were together in something shared called high school. And it, it, you know, I participate in this community and I feel like I am a shuttle. I feel like I am a, a weaving shuttle. You know, I, I'm just weaving, 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 you know, go to the grocery store. Hi, hi, hi. How are you? How did it go yesterday when you were at the XYZ? Oh, I saw on Facebook that you PDQ. And so it may be scale. It may be a question of scale. And, but it's also a question I was talking to a guy the other day who's a climate psychologist, and he was talking about a Freudian interpretation of, you know, basically existential angst and, you know, why people are so afraid. And I said, I think part of culture, culture is, culture arose from a landscape. It was a, it was a, a dictionary of survival in a landscape you know, whether it's the tundra or the rainforest, you know, up here, people are the cedar salmon people. And, you know, and I went place someplace in Thailand and I saw people being very effective at surviving in their place. I thought they were bamboo banana people. You know, people know how to survive together in a landscape, but the landscape through capitalism became resources. It's not like Freudian. It's, it's that disconnection from place. And I think part of what makes this my place, it's not great. And as I said earlier, it's being taken over by, you know, the financialization of real estate and vacation rentals, but there's something about a boundary and a mutual aid necessitated by a boundary that makes a difference. So how do we apply this to our, our understanding? How, how can we, where can we celebrate? Well, I, I agree with you that, that it's not a Freudian problem. And that was a very mean thing of mid-century psychologists and social scientists to do because Freudianism had basically blamed the individual for the problem and not just mm-hmm. you as an individual, but there's an individual inside you that you can't even know unless you come to me. And that's the one to blame, you know, your inner psyche, self subconscious, whatever. It's like, Oh, great. So it's not just me. That's the problem. It's a me inside me that I can't even know. <laughs> you know, I can't even be more right. guilty. I'm, I'm guilty for things. I'm guilty for things. I don't even know. I think, you know, and that's like, I get that. So then the idea is you, well, you conform the individual to the society. The other thing that makes me think when you talk about culture, you know, and and culture growing in the tundra or culture growing in the rainforest and how different cultures grow in different places. Culture, when you're in the lab, you grow a culture on a medium, Mm. right? That's what they call it. An agar dish, you know, a Petri Mm -hmm. dish, put medium and then you grow your Mm -hmm. bacteria or your fungus on a medium. Mm. So In a natural world, the medium in which the culture grows is the rainforest is the medium in which these people are growing. So those are their interdependencies and the tundra. It's these 
in a modern world, the medium on which we're growing, it might have been city streets. It could be capitalism. It could be now these media. So our, our mass media and our interactive media are the media in which our culture is trying to grow. And these are media that are, are predisposed to isolate and alienate and extract value from isolated individuals who are being intentionally disoriented and decalibrated by technologies, right? That are designed right. at Stanford to decalibrate you. So we are, we are trying to shepherd or raise or steward a culture on an intentionally disorienting, decalibrating medium. Bingo. The answer, bingo, of course, bingo, bingo. Yeah. Is to get off that media when you can, or at least when you're on it, acknowledge that you're on it. I can't see your pupils. I can't tell where we're, we can't establish the same kind of rapport here. So we have to compensate for it, which we're both experienced at doing. You know, so I know that even though I can't, my mirror neurons can't fire when your head nods, I can remember what it would be like for you. To, I can and, and right. simulate it, right? It's almost like a, right. a social porn that we're doing, right? It's like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not because it's not right. real, real, but it's close. I'm a cam girl. <laughs> yeah, in a sense. Yeah. But the psychic cam girl, a, tr a true spiritual love connection, community cam exactly. girl, you know, not a, not a, it's not about, not the a, not a, not a, you know, right. Yeah. It's not about what they, whatever they do in the, in those, the, those things. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Um, we should not even, I know I'm afraid to go. I'm afraid. Um, Cause then my cam might go on and then they'd see me. Um, I don't know how it even. Don't worry. Another don't worry. We're not talking about I'm it. I'm going to talk to one of my students and find out what they do. Um, <sighs> yes. Yeah, so, so basically there's another um, point of intervention, which isn't like smarty pants, coastal people, but just like noticing where the healthy media as in mediums, plural are, right. where are the healthy and so it's like social clubs. It's it's like the old social capital, you know, where, where we go bowling alone and bowling together. Yeah. Where are people having the most fun and then going exactly. there and not worrying? Well, you know, so many people I know if I say, well, just go where they're having the most fun. It's like, well, how will that help my career? Well, can I then I can I write about it? Can I, who will I mean? It's like, no, there's no net. You're not going to get to network there. You're not going to get yeah. to network. Is that OK? You know, and that's part right. of why, you know, it was great that the Israelites gave themselves the Sabbath, you know, at least one day, Moishi, one day a week. You can't work. Mm. What are you not going to make anything? No, you're not even allowed to work. You got to just celebrate that you're alive and sacred just the way you are, you know. And boy, could you imagine if people and again, you're right. More people on the right are taking that one day a week off than on the left, you know, and that's, I mean, it's not a problem of rightism or leftism, but it's partly because the right have um, maintained, um, even b blindly have maintained some of the traditions that were put in place to protect us from ourselves. You know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, the, you know, I don't, the family, the family is a, is a unit of society. Uh, morality. I mean, I, I like the term morality. It means like, you know, wrestling with, you know, complexity and making yeah. moral choices. I think that's one of the coolest things to do. It's like, I find that fun. It um, is. I know that's <laughs> one of the great stories in, in this new book, in the Survival of the Richest book, is this argument I got into at a cocktail party with uh, Richard Dawkins. You know, oh my. I was trying to argue that the universe leans toward morality, that that morality is a thing, that there's more going on here than just competition between genes for dominance. And he called me a, a moralist. And then, you know, 20 years later, I see the picture of him and his other, you know, scientific atheist buddies on the Lolita Express. You know, they're flying on Epstein's plane out to the TED conference. And I think, all right. There's a reason why that amoral brand of scientism dovetailed so conveniently with the, right. the amoral dominator fantasies of a Jeffrey Epstein, because there's no if you're living in a universe without uh, uh, it's not that you have to believe in God, but if you don't believe in the sacred, 
uh, if you don't believe that human beings have souls uh, trying to do good, then it's way easier to just yeah, yeah. take. Totally. I think another thing listening to you that I think is sort of like a tool we can use is category disruption. For example, I'm conservative. I want to conserve nature. I want to conserve relationships. I want to conserve meaning. Mm -hmm. I want to, you know, I want to conserve intact ecosystems. I'm conservative. So I'm going to take it. I'll take conservative. I've got it now, you know, and so, but I'm liberal because I think, you know, there is no, no particular groups has a, you know, a purchase on the, on the truth. We're finding truth together. We're evolving. You know, it's like, I'm pro-life. I want every child to have enough food and security, et cetera. You know, it's like, it's like, it's like we have to be courageous in category mixing. Yes, exactly. I've been calling myself a materialist lately, you know, a materialist because I believe that the, that matter matters. Totally. That if I'm going to buy something, I want to take care of it and keep it and cherish it. This thing that I have, this thing, it's not disposable. I am a materialist. The, these materials, my my baby Yoda keychain, hopefully <laughs> I will have this throughout the rest of my life. This is my baby yeah. Yoda keychain. Totally. I, I used to say with your money, your life is like, it's not the problem is it's not that we're materialists. We're bad materialists. Right. We are just dis, disrespectful materialists. Well, that's we where I think where I actually I think that's where I got it from, to be oh. honest. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Thank you. I'm sure I I've stolen internalized a it, ton from I you. I internalized it to the point that I thought it was mine. <laughs> but yeah, it was your book. I got that one. I love that one. I love that one because we are. It's, it's fine. You know, so. I, I, it is true when you flip the categories, all of a sudden, damn right, I'm a conservative. I'm trying to conserve our species, our planet, our resources, you know, rather than spewing. I mean, the amount of energy we're using, it's not just unsustainable. We are, we are using pulsed energy at this point. It's like we are, we're not just burning things. We are exploding things in order to have enough energy. Well, you know, just to go over to the war in Ukraine, I mean, like there could be nothing more insane than sending billions of dollars of weapons. And I am not like pro-Russia, blah, blah, blah. Billions of dollars of weapons that are on a one-time journey to be exploded. You know, it's just like exploding things, taking, taking resources out of the body of Mother Gaia making them into something like grifting off the profit, you know, which is like, yeah. and then sending them over to be exploded. What a perfect consumer yeah. product because At least it's going to be exploding. Those things kills people where like Bitcoin, you're just exploding things for nothing, right? <laughs> We're just worshiping a, an abstract number system by burning resources it's like pure what is that, temple. NFTs or something. Yeah, and whatever, and Bitcoin and and then proof of work and all. Just burn stuff to prove that we love this coin. Totally. It's, so anyway, I'm just saying I'm we're gonna like start to wind up because I promised you that we would go for an hour, and I know it's gonna take us 20 minutes to just slow this <laughs> tanker down and, and dock it somewhere. <laughs> but you know. I think there's a couple of things that are kind of coming out of this conversation. Um, one is that category mixing to have the courage to not be, you know, what do you call it? It's, it's not exactly ideological. It's just like, it's like, it's like not, not willfully crossing the narrative of your tribe, but, but thoughtfully saying, well, wait a second, what really is wrong with. Right. We don't have to stay in our lane all the time. Exactly. You can try on someone else's reality tunnel for a bit and see what's there of value in this one. I mean, the Mormons, my God, you know, if you need a job or need a meal or need a place to stay, if you're a Mormon, you're a lucky guy. 
you know, because right. someone's going <laughs> to, you're going to. Exactly. I'll just take, take Mormons you. with, you know, without the patriarchy. Can we do yeah. that? Yeah. OK, thank you. <laughs> Can they keep the uh, multiple marriage, whatever that's called? They don't have it. Polyamory. Yeah. yeah. They, you know, that's that's really that's the sort of thing, too, that we do to one another. We take the extreme and we slather that all over right. everybody, you know, so. It's like there's there's subsects that are not very well loved in the Mormons that do practice polygamy, right? Um, but they have a different word for it. But most Mormons they don't do that. You know, it's sort of right. like, yeah, you know, it's like people on the left. We're not all Antifa with you know black masks out in the street, and you know, we're not doing that. Right. We're just liberals. <laughs> <laughs> We just we, own ourselves. We, just like, we like AOC. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like, so it's like mixing up categories, having the courage to do that, flipping them, like saying, yeah, I'm conservative. Yeah. I'm pro-life. You know, it's like, just take it. And then the other thing is, is, is like to think about how, you know, like the things that we can do, through participation and love to support the mediums, the growth, you know, the agar agar. Yeah. On which mutuality, reciprocity grow and celebrate that. Like, oh man, what a great church. I really love that church because they're really, you know, doing a great thing for their people. Just, I think, I think part of where we're being shoved is into extremes and we don't want to go there. What we want to do is, is sort of be friendly on the playground. Yeah. You know, and so much of that is about getting away from this kind of ends justifies the means goal orientation. You know, if it's mm -hmm. not, if you're not doing it in the moment, you're not doing it, you know, exactly. <laughs> I gave up this last year. What I get, one of the things I gave up was in order to, right. I'm doing this in order to that. And every time I catch myself saying that I stop it, I'm doing this because I'm, I'm doing it and I want to. Right. <laughs> and it, it could have one of 50 outcomes. And the only way it's going to have an outcome that I enjoy is if I keep doing things that I enjoy. I want to bring up something now, you know, because um, I don't know if you knew Hazel Henderson. Mm. Um, yeah, Hazel. Yeah. Um, well, she passed away last weekend. Oh, I didn't know. Um, she huh. went virtual, as she says, and she was completely ready to do it. And she had all her affairs in order oh, and she was in high spirits. Um, well, she's had her affairs in order for 60 years, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that's one of the things she did was, was flipping categories. She just like, you can't have anything, any valuable idea or word or anything that, that, and take it away from me. If it's beautiful, I will just flip the category. And the other thing she said uh, to me, her last sort of her, her semi last words <laughs> that I, that is sort of like the meme for my life now, which is, she said, it's going to be a shit show for the next five years. So tell the truth and enjoy your life. I think that's it. Yeah. You know, it's like in this shit show, what should we do? Tell the truth. Tell the truth. It's not like tell your opinions or tell your ideology or tell, you know, the re repetitive message oh. from your overlords. People are so afraid to tell the truth. They're so afraid because they think that they're that something's wrong with them and other people will find out and they got to hide. And it's like, no, it's really, we're all, we're all there. We're all so there. Mm. So that's the other thing we can cultivate is truth telling with kindness. You yeah. Know? Well, we don't have and, to tell the truth. I don't have to tell you. I mean, about you, it's like, tell the truth about yourself, you know, yeah. reveal yourself, expose yourself. It's really not so bad. You'll find out that other people will look and they'll go, Oh, that's kind of funny. Or that's kind of cute. Or I'm sorry you feel that way. But let's let's love you enough so you don't feel like that anymore. You know? Or I have been I have just been assiduously revealing things that I've been hiding. <laughs> and every time I do it and I do it like, you know, with just without a lot of spin to it. I just like people say, oh, I love you even more. Oh, you're so courageous, you know. 
it's like, it's, it's, it's revelatory for me that telling the truth without spin, without aggression, without trying to prove something or be better than other people, but just actually um, taking away the screen of self-presentation and, you know, it's like we used to say, nobody here but us chickens, you know, it's like, that's, I think that's disarming. I think yeah. it's disarming. It's funny. I once, um, I was at a conference where one of the speakers was one of these guys who uh, can, can tell when people are lying. Have you ever seen those guys? It's like a hypnosis thing, except it's the opposite. They'll like line five people up on the stage and, and tell, you know, one of them to lie. And then they can always figure out which one it is or, or, you know, it, it, it's just this skill. And he like used to do it for the CIA or whatever, you know, these truth guys. <laughs> and Oh, right, right, right. And he revealed, and they even had a TV show for a while. One of these guys, um, lie like, to you me. Know, yeah, lie to me. They're like a human lie detector and they really, they just know how to do it. And what they're doing is basically leveraging things that we all do subconsciously all the tells that we give each other. And I'm like, well, if he can do it, it means that we're all doing it all the time. So that mm -hmm. even if someone doesn't know consciously you're lying to them, subconsciously they know you're lying to them. So there's no point in lying. There really is no point in it. You know what I mean? It's they know. really interesting. It's like, what is the zone of white lies? What are... What is the zone of white lies and, you know, where you just, you know, it just sort of greases the social wheels. You know, do you need to tell that somebody that that dress really makes them look fat? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Or yeah. what? Or like today, let's say I just didn't feel like doing this today. I could send you an email and say, oh, you know, my daughter needs me to tutor her on a test, so I can't really do it today. And then create a whole thing. Or I could email you and say, you know, I'm not feeling it. And you would say, then let's wait. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, why? Exactly. We can't exactly. help it. So it's like, that's another thing. It's like, just clean up the signal. Just yeah. clean up the signal of your own life. You know, tell the truth and enjoy your life. See, the thing is, she didn't say tell the truth. She so, said, tell the truth and enjoy your life. That's a little bit in, in our society, like patting your head and rubbing your stomach. You know, mm. it's like, because enjoying your life, is just enjoying your life. It's just being alive. It's not controlling things. And yet telling the truth could be part of what you enjoy, not because you're hostile or you're calling people out or calling them in or like, you know, it's just like, wow, that doesn't sound really right. Could you rephrase that? Because the way you said it just didn't sound right to me. Help mm. me out. You know, that sort of thing. Right. Yeah, I just going think, for signal over noise is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so simple when you and I talk. <laughs> just If only everyone was like us. I think, I think it would be very difficult to live in this world. But that's the point, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah we want to make it difficult to live in, in the, um, you know, in the tech, the techno mindset. Anyway, mm. so we're going to we're going to like like take it home. And so you get a chance to say whatever you want to say in summary. I experience an ease with you uh, and it's an ease that I think is is. It's it's engendered by unconditional acceptance that's all it is you're unconditionally accepted it's like what what do you got i'll either love it or i'll metabolize it <laughs> you know? yeah, right. or i'll challenge it but i'll be do it right. nicely <laughs> right right it's like whatever yeah. what do you whatever you know what right. what i can't and it's just there's so few people i know that i can experience no worry no, I have no worry. Right. I, I feel there's nothing I can do wrong. You know what I mean? And that's I do, you know, and that's and that. I guess what that means is in the end, I trust myself when I'm with you. There's nothing I could do wrong means I also trust that I'm not a bad person. I'm a good person. Right. Of course, there's nothing I can do wrong because what am I going to do that's wrong? You know, it might be stupid. And then you'll say, Doc, that's a little stupid, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but um. <laughs> 
And, and that and that that is what I'm trying to learn how to how to do, how to be, how to manifest that right. that space around myself that gives people per- permission to manifest. And that uh, so yay for that. Thank you for yay. that and modeling that. And uh, and and next time we speak, you can, we're going to see how well I'm doing that. I'm not going to evaluate you. You just, you, you can judge yourself if you I like, will. but uh, I, will. I would like to say in response to <laughs> that, I love you too. I really do. I love being around you. I feel the same way. It's just, it's like we're bouncing on a trampoline together. And every time like you come down and you're like, okay, take this. <laughs> and you come down really heavy and I like soar up and I go like, oh my God. Like, <laughs> you know, it feels like that. It feels like an infinite game. That's mm. what we started talking about. The finite game is, is playing to win and the infinite game is playing to enjoy yourself. Yeah. And uh, so I'm all for that. Let's enjoy our lives and speak the truth and, get through the shit show together <laughs> you got it hey my friend thank you so so much hey thanks for listening don't forget to subscribe and leave us a five-star review so that this hopeful message can get out to more people check out post carbon institute's resilience website for show notes and for more guest information thanks also to a Cher miller emmy Burringrood, and clara winter of post carbon institute plus production assistant Michelle Wig from frugalityandfreedom.com.